Well, as we begin a new teaching series going through the book of Philippians, I invite you to open to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church to encourage them to not give up in following Jesus. That no matter what their circumstances were, Paul was writing to them to keep them focused on Jesus, keep them focused on the gospel, to make sure that their priority always was worshiping Jesus, praising God, and sharing the gospel. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's, that's a reminder I constantly need in my life and in my heart. Because it is so easy for us to get distracted in this world and in this life with things that are not about Jesus, about the mission of sharing the gospel, of bringing that good news of grace and mercy and forgiveness to the world around us. There are so many things fighting for our attention, fighting for our emotions, and quite honestly, fighting for our worship and our dedication. And so Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi to encourage them and to remind them to keep their focus on Jesus at all times, to make sure that Jesus is the center and the heart of their worship and their lives. In fact, in Philippians chapter 1, there's an incredibly famous phrase that Paul writes. He says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's a good chance you have heard that Bible verse before. To live is Christ. It sounds beautiful. It is beautiful. But what does that actually look like here and now? in our lifetime and in our world. What does Paul mean by saying, well, for me to live is Christ? Well, obviously he means that for him, his whole life is about Jesus, about making Jesus known, sharing the gospel, making sure that the center of his heart, the priority of his life is worshiping Jesus and sharing the love of Jesus with the world around him. So how do we here in 2021, go about doing that. When there is so much division, there is so much chaos, there is so much brokenness in the world, and not just in the world, but in our world, in our own personal lives and families, there is heartache, there is grief, there is sorrow, there is anger, there is conflict and division even in our homes and our families. So how do we go about with all that happening of staying focused on Jesus so we can join with Paul in saying, for me to live is Christ. Well, the first step is that we begin with prayer. The letter of Philippians begins with prayer and it ends in prayer. And at the end of his letter in Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes this. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. See, Paul admonishes, he encourages the church in Philippi, he encourages you and I to begin with prayer. That no matter what circumstances we are facing, whether on a global scale, whether in our nation, or simply in your own home, Paul says, here is how you make Jesus the center of your life, the center of your circumstances. Begin with prayer prayer. And I love that Paul, he gets rid of all the excuses because our gut reaction is, well, prayer is nice, but I'm not going to do it because I can take care of it myself. Well, I don't, I don't think prayer is the answer to this, okay? If I go through enough steps and, and things don't work out the way I plan and the way I was trying to make them, okay, then I will pray. But Paul says, in everything, 
And before you kind of push it aside as just, oh, okay, that's neat advice, and say, oh, well, he's the Apostle Paul. Of course he's going to pray. Paul is writing from prison. And on his way to prison, he has been mistreated. He has been abused. He has been shipwrecked. The majority of his friends and closest people in his life have abandoned him except for a select few. And as we're going to read later on, as we continue going through Philippians, his reputation is being smeared and tarnished throughout the land by people that want to cause him even more trouble while he's already in prison. So Paul is saying, from a place of pain, hurt, conflict, a place where he on the surface looks like he has every right to be angry and bitter and to seek revenge, Paul says, even in those circumstances, in everything, pray. So whether it is the best time of your life or incredibly overwhelming and heart-wrenching time, Paul says, begin with prayer. Whether it is times of rejoicing and celebrating or times of tears and grieving and sorrow, Paul says, here's how you keep Jesus at the center. Begin with prayer. Whether it is times of peace and harmony in everybody in your life and in the world getting along, or whether there is some deep strife and discord, there's some deeply rooted division and conflict, Paul says, here is how you keep Jesus as the priority, as the focus of your heart and life. You begin with prayer. So Paul ends his letter by pleading with the church, by pleading with you and I to keep Jesus at the center of our lives, to be able to say with him, to live is Christ. And he says, this is how you do it. You begin with prayer. He also begins his letter with prayer. So turn to, in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying. So there it is. He begins by saying, here is what I am doing. I am always praying. Now here is what Paul is praying for. For throughout his letters, throughout his ministry, throughout the letter of Philippi, he is praying for two things. He is praying for the church to stay focused on Jesus. And he is praying for the gospel to keep spreading because of the church. So Paul prays for the church that we would, no matter what is going on in the world, would stay focused on Jesus and our mission to share the message and the hope of Jesus with the people in our lives. And then he also prays for the gospel to keep spreading throughout the world because of us, because of the church that we stayed focused and we kept Jesus as our priority. And because of that, more and more people put their faith in Jesus. So this is what Paul prays through throughout his letters. This is what he is hoping to see. Now in chapter 1 of this letter to the church in Philippi, he's going to give us four specific prayers. And the first one is praying for the church. And so he continues in verse 4. He says, Always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul is praying for the church. So the first question I have for you is, are you praying for the church? Are you praying for people? So often, what we do when we say, okay, now I'm going to become a prayer warrior. Now I'm going to really start praying in my life. Is we focus on praying about our wants, our needs, our circumstances. 
And one of the things that we tend to lead off is praying for others. And so Paul is giving us this reminder in his own life that he is praying for the church. He is praying for the members of the church. He is praying for other Christians, that they would stay strong in their faith, that they would be comforted by the hope and the mercy of God, no matter what they're going through, if they are overwhelmed, if they are hurting, if they're going through sorrow and grief, they, they would be comforted by the Holy Spirit. Paul is praying for the church. So as an example for us, we need to be praying for the church, that the church would stay focused on its mission, that we as the church would stay focused on our mission of making Jesus known in the world, of sharing the gospel, the good news of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus, that salvation and forgiveness of sins is found in Him. So we need, I need, and you need to be praying for the church to stay focused on Jesus. One practical side effect of this is that when we tend to get angry, we tend to, as human beings, divide ourselves into us versus them. But there's a side effect of this prayer is that when we start praying for them, that division begins to go away. That conflict that we set up in our hearts and our minds of us versus them begins to disappear. It begins to not exist. I mean, imagine how much more joy you would have in your heart. How much more peace you would have with other people that instead of complaining about them, you prayed for them. Right, Paul is praying for everyone. He says, I pray for every single one of you. Are you really telling me that a world filled with sinners that none of them ever sinned against Paul caused him hurt, upset his feelings? And yet what does Paul say? I pray for all of you because we're partners in the gospel. Right? This is how Paul views other people. This is how he views other Christians. He says, this is how I view the church that I pray for you. Because we are partners together in the gospel. We are united together because of Jesus. Despite any of our other differences from an earthly view, we are eternally united together because of Jesus. So if you want less conflict in your life, a little less stress, a little less bitterness, instead of complaining and griping and gossiping about others and instead of always drawing a line in the sand and saying that's it they crossed it no more that we would follow the example of Paul and we would pray for them that we would pray that Jesus would be the center of their lives that we would pray we'll talk about a little while that Jesus would stay the center of our own lives but Paul mentions something here that it's about the partnership in the gospel, which leads to his second prayer, which is the gospel itself. Paul is praying for the gospel to spread through the church. In Philippians 1 verse 6, he says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ." Jesus. So Paul is praying for the gospel to keep working in our lives, to keep working in the world. And he also gives us the reason of why he is so confident in his prayers. Because he is confident in God. You notice Paul's not confident in his prayers because he's Paul and he's an apostle. He is confident in his prayers because of who God is. This is what he says. I am sure of this, not of his prayers, 
not of his status as an apostle. He is sure of this, that he, that is God, who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's saying, I'm confident that God is still at work in your lives. And what a powerful reminder that is right now. We all know that 2020 was exhausting, overwhelming, and heartbreaking for so many reasons. And I'm sure many of you entered 2021 with great hopes and dreams that this year would be different, it would be a year of change, a year of growth, a, a year of life just simply being better. And then we very quickly realized there is still a lot of hurt and brokenness and sin in this world. And I don't know about you, but for me, I kind of just had to let out a sigh. And hopefully the Holy Spirit took that as a prayer and, and, and translated it to God for me. Because looking at the news and seeing the division and the conflict and the heartache in the world, it was just, come on. Like, there, there has to be something better than this. 2020 was so rough and overwhelming. I, why, why does this have to start off so painful, so broken? And then on top of just what is happening in the national news, there is also the heartache of what's happening in people's lives. And spending time as a pastor praying with folks who are facing difficult medical diagnosis and tests. And there's a lot of fear that goes with that. Folks who are struggling with family conflict and strained relationships. People who are grieving the loss of loved ones. So here's the reality is that, yeah, there, there is the national news. The things that we are so aware of and seeing constantly on our screens, revealing the brokenness and sin of our nation and of the world. But then there's just also the, the heavy-heartedness what's happening in, in our worlds, in our own personal lives, in the lives of loved ones and, and church members. And so we need this reminder from the Apostle Paul, who, remember, is writing from prison, who has been abandoned by loved ones and friends, who is being gossiped about and having his reputation ruined and tarnished. And he's still saying, but I'm confident, despite all the circumstances that are piling up around me and around us, that God is still at work in the church, in your life, and in the world. And this is a tremendous hope and encouragement for us, that yes, there are difficulties ahead of us, there are painful moments, there is conflict, there is sin, there is division in the world. And yet, God is still at work in changing and transforming lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in fact, Paul doesn't come up with this idea on his own. He gets this from Jesus himself. In John chapter 5, Jesus says this, my father is still working, and I am working also. Truly, I tell you, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son likewise does these things. My father is still working, and I am working also. So Paul's prayer for the church, Paul prays for the gospel to keep spreading and his confidence is that it will. That the message of Jesus Christ will continue to change hearts and minds and lives and eternities because God is still at work. God is still at work in your life, in your family's life, in our city, and in our nation. And so we as a church do not give up, that we are able to keep Jesus as the center of our lives. 
as the priority of our lives because He is still at work, so we don't give up. The third thing that the Apostle Paul prays for is for unity in the church. Philippians 1 verse 7 through 8. Indeed, it is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So again, Paul calls the members of the church, his partners in the gospel. Anybody with a screen knows that there's a lot of division in our world. And one of the things that Paul is praying for that is so vital is for unity in the church that we would not be divided, that we would not set up barriers of us versus them against other Christians, against other Christian churches, and against other members of our own churches. But that instead, we would show the world a different way, the way of Jesus, which is one of peace and unity. And so Paul unites the church and he prays for the unity by reminding them of who they are, reminding you and me of who we are, which is partners in grace, partners in the gospel. The thing that unites us is that we have all received grace and mercy, forgiveness of sins, and salvation from Jesus Christ, which is why so often throughout the New Testament, Paul and the other authors of the New Testament refer to the members of the church as brothers and sisters. He's saying, Look, you, you were once divided according to worldly standards. But now in Jesus, you are brothers and sisters. You are partners in grace. You are partners in the gospel. And as Paul is working through these prayers, he is reminding us of our purpose as a church and as Christ followers individually, which is to share the gospel, to make Jesus the center of our lives. We will say with Paul, for me to live is Christ. And so he reminds us that one of the ways we do that is by being united and partnering together in the grace of Jesus, in the gospel of Jesus. This is not just a nice idea of let's just get along. Again, Paul gets this from Jesus. Jesus himself told the apostles, this is how you are to behave, to show the rest of the world that you are my disciples. Because as divided as the world is right now, what they need is a hope that can unite them, that can bring forgiveness, that can bring reconciliation. And that hope is found only in Jesus. And you and I as the church have that answer. We have that hope because we're partners in the gospel. But if the world that is so divided looks at the church and looks at you and I and at the emails and the texts and the phone calls and the posts on social media that we make, and they look at us and they say, you're just as divided and just as judgmental and just as hypocritical as we are, why would we ever join you? See, this is why Paul is praying for unity in the church. He's reminding the church, he's reminding you and I of who we are, that we are partners in the gospel. And part of our mission of sharing that gospel is to show unity in the grace of Jesus Christ. Because what a conflicted, divided world desperately needs is the grace of Jesus a grace that is big enough to bring forgiveness and healing and reconciliation. Jesus taught this to the apostles, to you and I, in John chapter 13. I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. The one another's that Jesus refers to is other Christians. Loving 
one another, partnering together in the grace and the gospel of Jesus as Christians is central and vital to our mission of witnessing to who Jesus is to the rest of the world. And Jesus goes on in John chapter 13, verse 35, and says this, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You can hear this echoed in the words of Paul when he says, For God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. See, it's not just, I love other people, I love other Christians according to my standards, according to my preferences, according to the way I want to love them. It's love one another as I have loved you. Love other people, love other Christians the way Jesus has loved you. And Jesus connects this to our witness. He connects it to our mission of how is the rest of the world going to know that we really follow Jesus, that we really are partners in the gospel, that we are partners together in the grace of Jesus. Jesus tells us, he says, by this, by the way we love others, they will know that we follow Jesus. The fourth thing that, G, that Paul prays for is for us, for our own individual faith and following of Jesus. He says in verse 9 and 10 and 11, And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. As we begin a new year, there's always lots of goals, lots of dreams, lots of hopes, a lot of plans for how we're going to personally grow. We do this physically with more exercise, better healthy eating and dieting, all kinds of things. Maybe you want to do some self-improvement so you're getting some coaching, you're, you're reading some books. We also do it spiritually. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to, I'm going to read the Bible more. I'm going, to, I'm going to get to know the Word of God more. And all of these things are good. But I know for myself, and I don't want to assume for anybody else because probably better people than I am, but I know for myself, I have never once ever made a New Year's resolution or a new plan or set a new goal for a new year that says, I want to be better at loving people. I probably should have, and it's something I need to work on and get better at, but I've never made that a resolution, a goal, or a plan. But here's what Paul prays for you and for me. That your love will keep on growing. One of the things that the Apostle Paul is hoping for the church in Philippi, he's hoping for the church everywhere. He's hoping for you and me in our lives as Jesus followers here and now in 2021 is that we would grow in our love. And in our knowledge and our discernment of God's word and God's truth. And also that we would grow in righteousness. A righteousness, he says, that comes from Jesus. What he means by that is that we would grow in the gospel. That Jesus, through his perfect life, through his death, through his resurrection, has given you and I the gift of righteousness. That we have been made right with God. That we have had our sins forgiven. We have received the gift of of salvation. He's saying, I want you to grow in that. I want you to grow in your knowledge of the gospel, of how much mercy and grace that God has had for you and Jesus. Because when you grow in your knowledge of that, you are going to grow in your ability to share that kind of grace and love and mercy with the world around you. So at the end of his prayers here, Paul makes it 
personal for us. That we individually would grow in love, that we would grow in righteousness in our understanding of the gospel so that we could love others better, that we could keep sharing the gospel of Jesus with others. And this is how he ties it up through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Why should we grow in love? Why should we grow in our knowledge of the gospel? So that God gets glory and praise. Another way to put it, so that more and more people would worship Jesus. So we have a beautiful message. You and I as the church have the only hope that the world needs. We have the only answer to all the conflict, all the division, all the sin in the world. It's the gospel of Jesus. And Paul encourages you and I to begin with prayer. So I want to share a prayer with you that leads us into personal growth and personal repentance. And it comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. You have probably heard this verse in your lifetime. You may have heard it recently. But here is a prayer from a message from God's Word in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. God says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. There are two things we desperately need in our personal lives and in our nation right now. Forgiveness for sins and a healing of our land. A healing that brings about reconciliation and forgiveness and peace. Now, one of the things about this verse that's incredibly famous is that it gets shared a lot. Oh, yeah, we need, we need prayer in this land. We need the worship of God in this land. We need forgiveness. We need healing in this land. And all those things are true. But so often in my life, I was taught it and heard it and saw other people teach it online and other places of always having this attitude of, yeah, if they would just start praying and if they would just start worshiping God, we, this place would be a lot better. That, that healing would come. But that's not what God says. God puts some parameters on this blessing of forgiveness and healing. And it isn't uh, convince them to do it. It isn't judge them from afar. It isn't point the finger and say, look how wrong these people are. And if they would just, you know, get with the program, things would be a lot better. Now, God starts with you and I as his people. It starts with you and me as followers of Jesus. Because we're the ones who have the hope, we're the ones who have the grace, we're the ones who have the message of Jesus that brings about forgiveness and healing and reconciliation and peace. And so we're the ones that are responsible for sharing it. And so what I want to do is just walk through what God says here in 2 Chronicles. The first is that my people, so it starts with you and I, would humble themselves. So the question we have to ask is, have I humbled myself? And on the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is talking about judging others, which is one of the favorite things we love to do as humans, he warns people and he says, and he tells you and I as his followers, do not be concerned, do not worry about the speck that is in your brother, in your neighbor's eye, when you have a board or a plank or really a two by four in your own eye. He says, first, take care of the plank that is in your own eye before you take care of the speck that is in their eye. So God 
first says to his people, to you and I, you got to humble yourselves. The question is, have I humbled myself? Have I come to God in humility? Have I come to God in repentance and confession of sin? And said, God, there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of division, a lot of conflict, a lot of anger, hurt, bitterness, and a lot of sin in the world. But before I deal with that, I have a plank in my own eye. I have sin in my own heart. And I need your grace and I need your forgiveness. The second thing that God says to you and I as his people is to pray. So, was your first reaction to pray? Or was your first reaction to yell at somebody, judge somebody, post something, text somebody, send an email? What was your first reaction? Was it to pray? To ask God to bring forgiveness and healing? Or was it to stew? Was it to get angry? Was it to blame others. See, God is calling us to begin with prayer. To be His people who turn to Him in prayer as our first reaction, whatever the circumstances are, as Paul reminds us at the end of Philippians, that in everything, bring your requests to God. Third thing that God says is to seek God it says, seek my face. So as Paul has been teaching us in Philippians, make God your focus. Make God your priority. Don't make being right. Don't make winning an argument. Don't make whatever else you want to be your center, to be your priority. But to make God the center of the focus of your heart, of your worship, of your life. So that as Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, that God would get glory and praise. And so we are called as His people to seek His face, to seek His presence, to seek Him first and foremost, to make God our priority. And then the fourth thing he says to repent, to turn from their wicked ways. Now you got to be careful here because our temptation, I know in my own heart, my personal temptation is to hear that, oh, they need to turn from their wicked ways. Yeah, they do. But the there that God is calling to turn from their wicked ways is His own people. So we are called as followers of Jesus to repent, to confess our own sin, our own anger, our own bitterness, our own idols. Don't confess the sins of others. Confess your own sins to repent and turn away from my own personal wicked ways. Again, what Jesus teaches, you got to deal with the plank in your own eyes. And then God says, I will bring forgiveness and healing. Notice he says, I will bring it. Not me, not you, not anybody else. It comes from God. The forgiveness, the healing, the reconciliation, the peace that we desperately need in our own personal lives, in our families, in our communities, and in our nation comes from no else except Jesus Christ and this is one of the most important things we need to get right as a church and as a people who follow Jesus and when we say we want to make Jesus the center of our lives to declare with Paul that to live is Christ that we have to for our own selves and then for the sake of the world always remember and always keep proclaiming the gospel, which is that salvation is found in no one else. 
with Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter in the book of Acts declares for everybody to hear, there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved than that of Jesus. There is no forgiveness. There is no reconciliation. There is no healing. There is no peace without Jesus. For you, for me, or for our nation. So as a church, as individual followers of Jesus, we need to be people who keep Jesus at the center of all things, including our hope including our prayers and including the message that we proclaim to the world that the forgiveness, the healing, the reconciliation and the peace that this world that they need, that our nation needs is found in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, forgive us when we come up short when we get off track and make anything else our priority and our focus of our hearts, our worship, and our lives, but you. Be merciful and gracious to us as your people and make us a people that can declare with Paul, for me to live is Christ. That we would be a people who make you the center of our lives at all times and in all circumstances. And that we would share the one and only hope of the world with the people in our lives and with our nation. That forgiveness and healing and reconciliation and peace is found only in you. In your name we pray. Amen.